Averly. So thanks for joining us, Dr. Averly. You're welcome. Thank you for um, attending today's session. As Bob mentioned, I'm uh, Professor Jim Averly, and I am one of the two professors who coordinate our capstone sequence. And the capstone sequence, of course, is E 488 and E 489. And I just wanted to talk to you today about what uh, expectations you should have for this core sequence, um, what it's all about, what are some of the things that you will be doing, and uh, also answer any questions that you might have and tell you a little bit about what uh, our expectations are for you as students. So um, one of the things that uh, I should point out right from the beginning is that this course sequence is quite a bit different from other courses in the electrical engineering program in the sense that in most of the courses in the EE program, you study a related set of fundamental engineering principles and you apply these principles to solve relatively simple close-ended problems on homeworks and quizzes and exams. Now, when you um, become quote unquote real engineers and are being paid to do engineering, it's extremely unlikely that your boss is gonna come in with a textbook and hand it to you and say, solve problems you know, 8, 11, and 15 at the back of the chapter. So um, in other words, the types of problems that you are going to be working on as engineers are quite a bit different. You'll be applying the fundamental engineering principles that you've learned, but you'll be applying them in a context, say in corporate America where the company wants to make money, there are many other considerations that you have to account for, not just um, you know, whether the circuit works in a simulation or uh, according to your calculations or not. So um, the real world is, is, is quite a bit more complicated than the simple uh, engineering principles that we teach you in most of the courses. And in most courses, there's usually just one instructor to whom you must answer. And Capstone's different in that you're going to have to answer to multiple stakeholders and also to the uh, to your peers, your your teammates. In Triple E 488 and 489, you're going to need to apply engineering principles from many different classes. So you may want to form teams with students that have different course uh, work experience. You're going to need to learn something about soft engineering considerations. And, and a good example of that is the manufacturability of a concept. You can have you know, a paper design that works uh, wonderfully, but if you can't make it, if you can't produce it, it, it has very little value. And you're gonna work in teams on an open-ended project. And it's not um, only the, um, uh, the project goals, but the project definition may evolve over time. So you, um, you have to understand that you may start out with a very ambitious project and have to hone it down so that you have a deliverable at the end of the sequence. It also might be that you thought achieving certain goals was going to be too hard, you know, very hard, but you did achieve them and you want to expand the scope of your project uh, and make it even more compelling for uh, to demonstrate at the end of the capstone sequence. And uh, in addition to the course coordinator, to the instructional team, you're going to have to answer to a technical mentor. Usually, but not always, your technical mentor is a electrical engineering program faculty member. There are other situations where that technical mentor might be a person from industry. So for example, one um, General Dynamics is a company that uh, really does a good job in mentoring uh, capstone teams. They're very interested in doing so and they do a really good job. In fact, I've had students that took this capstone sequence and completed a project that was mentored by General Dynamics, went to work for General Dynamics and are now mentoring capstone projects of their own. And this is great because they, you know, they've been through it themselves. They know what the expectations are. They know what student capabilities are like. So um, it, it, it tends to work quite well. And one of the things that you do um, instead of taking tests is you write reports 
and make oral presentations. Well, if um, one thing that you need, probably if you don't know this already, let me give you the bad news, which is when, when you're an engineer being paid to do engineering, writing reports and making oral presentations is going to be a big part of your job. And doing so effectively will have very positive outcomes for your career. And we're gonna help you to, to learn how to do that effectively in the capstone sequence. So um, it's worth reviewing what are the course objectives for EEE 488 and similar ones for EEE 489. Uh, the course objectives are that students can define and plan an engineering project involving multiple tasks and contributors. And also students can communicate and critically evaluate technical information. So if you think about these two things, being able to demonstrate to a potential employer that you can do these things is, is gonna be extremely important for your career path. So EEE 488 and EEE 489 are a two semester capstone senior design project course for electrical engineering students. You have to enroll in EEE 489 in the subsequent semester and you have to work in the same team throughout the sequence. If you don't take EEE 489 for whatever reason with your team, you have to retake the whole sequence. Even if you did fine in EEE 488, but somehow you don't register for, or you fail for some reason, EEE 489, you have to do it over again. The, um, the basic um, structure is that in EEE 488, teams are formed, projects and mentors are selected, and the planning, research, and design phase of the project is completed, and progress is documented. So depending on the nature of the project, the, the um, planning, research, and design may take uh, you know, different forms for different, different projects. In EEE 489, the plan is executed, evaluated, and improved. So typically with engineering projects, you know, it's not just, okay, we're gonna do this, you do it, and it's done. Typically it's, let's try this, see what happens, learn something, try something else, and keep iterating on a design until you achieve the goals of the project or perhaps modify the goals of the project to uh, be commensurate with what you've, what you've learned. The work in 489, you're gonna document um, a final report, of course, and then you also have to present the project to the public. I hope that many of you have had the opportunity to attend the Capstone Demo Day. If you haven't done so in the past, or even if you have, um, I would highly recommend that you attend the one this semester so the students that are currently completing 489 will be making their final project presentations. It's typically on the last Friday of the semester. Cheryl, is that still true for this semester? You're muted. It is true. Could you say the question again? Okay, sorry. Um, yes, is, when is the final capstone demo? Oh, April 30th. That's Check the last last Friday of the semester, is that right? Yeah, that's the last Friday. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's typically the situation. We always have the capstone demo day, the last Friday of classes in the semester. So um, I, again, I, and, and I believe that one will be virtual this semester as well. That's the plan so far, and the students will all get email reminders from me about this, so they'll have all that information. Okay, so it's very easy to attend um, as little or as much as you want. So I hope that you will join the capstone teams and uh, see what they've done and, and get a sense for what you might be working on in your capstone project. So let's talk about teams. So we allow teams to consist of three, four, or five members. Two isn't a team and six is too many. So it's got to be three, four, or five. And um, yeah, so that's, uh, you know, what we've de decided is a reasonable team for the capstone sequence. Now, of course, it's a little bit artificial, but it helps us to be able to achieve the academic goals of the course. Now, um, teams and relationships with mentors are on a at-will basis. 
So um, students form their own teams by connecting with each other and also finding mentors. A lot of times um, there will be project proposals that are offered by potential mentors that students can review. Other times students have ideas of their own or approach a potential mentor that they would like to work with. So it's a very ad hoc process, but it is a process that you have to be involved in and prepared for. And we usually um, try to get the teams formed and starting to work on their projects within the first month of the semester. Sometimes it takes a little longer, but we, we try to um, get you going as, as quickly as possible. And the team does remain intact for both EEE 488 and EEE 489. There is both individual work as well as teamwork. And there's an, a peer evaluation, an intra-team evaluation at the end of both semesters. And that's used to enforce individual accountability. And um, you can, you know, you can see your grade lowered substantially if you are not making a reasonable contribution to your team. And, you know, there may be folks that have gotten away with not performing, you know, well in a team in the previous uh, team projects in coursework. But by the time you reach the senior year and you're working for a full, you know, two semesters on a project, your teammates are probably not going to be very forgiving if you're not, uh, if you're not uh, performing. Um, and again, I think that if you have a teammate that's not performing, it's appropriate and, and uh, good advice to address that as early as possible. So what about the project mentor? Each team must be mentored by a mentor, project mentor, who is usually in, as I mentioned, but not always an E faculty member. Some project mentors have project ideas already in mind, um, some quite well-defined ones, and others will allow groups to define their own projects. Each group is required to find and work with a mentor and to define their project goals and scopes. And your project mentor answers to the director of the School of Electrical Computer and Energy Engineering for their mentorship of senior design teams. So what are some of the required attributes of a capstone project? Well, first, the project should be comprehensive and integrate multiple areas covered in your electrical engineering coursework. The problem should be an open-ended, challenging, and meet a societal need or want. The problem size should be appropriate for a small group, a two-semester time frame, and constrained resources. So hopefully your mentor has a good idea about what is appropriate for a small group, three to five members, two semester time frame where students have other obligations in addition to the senior design sequence and constrained resources. So money, lab space, et cetera, is all you know, limited. You'll be working on these projects intensely for the next two semesters. So make sure you pick a project that you find interesting. The projects are intended to be real world, open-ended, interdisciplinary endeavors, far more challenging than a homework assignment or a class project. The, again, I, I, you know, the, you're know, you used to working on homeworks and maybe short-term projects for classes. This is gonna be much more involved, much more like a real world, quote unquote, engineering project. Each capstone team must have a project mentor. You, you're gonna need some guidance from a mentor. Regardless of how the initial project definition arose, you, the student team, is expected to take full ownership of the project. This is not the mentor's project, this is your project. And you should have to learn new things to complete the project. You may have to learn things that your mentor doesn't know. Hopefully your mentor can guide you in how to learn these things, but you, you may need to learn, you may need to spend time in the library or scouring the internet uh, or performing, you know, learning how to set up certain equipment. You're going to have to learn new things and you should be prepared to do this throughout your engineering career. You, you just, you know, the, the academic courses that you take are not sufficient. 
than necessary but not sufficient conditions for being uh, an engineer in the real world. Your project mentor should guide you in determining what you need to learn and provide or recommend references or other resources. Your project mentor should also help the team break the project into logical steps with achievable milestones. So you're gonna to have to learn something about project management, how to manage yourself, how to achieve, uh, how to break projects into smaller uh, steps with achievable goals. What about uh, funding your project? So the electrical engineering program does provide a small amount of funding, a nominal amount of funding. However, um, many projects are going to require more funding than that. It may be that some faculty mentors have funding from grants or other accounts. It may be that you have an uh, industry mentor who is able to provide some funding. It may be that your uh, faculty mentor is working with a company that's providing funding. And, and I'm now mentoring three capstone teams that uh, is, are being sponsored by a company and the company is providing funding, you know, buying parts and, and, and uh, services for these teams to actually complete their project. So th that's one way that you can get additional funding. And also there is a, uh, a fund established by a benefactor to the electrical engineering program, and you can submit proposals that will be evaluated and uh, allow you to access additional funds. You'll be awarded additional funds. Um, Typically, we do, we, we do, you know, we're pretty generous with, with those awards. Okay, one of the things that um, you have to be able to do as engineers is to communicate effectively. You have to be able to um, produce technical communications. And technical communication is the process of conveying usable information about a specific domain to an intended audience. And these things could include things like uh, manuals, technical manuals, product specifications, reports, papers, etc. So, um, you know, being able to do perform technically and then communicate what you have done technically is an important skill. And part of the objectives of the capstone sequence is to help you to learn how to do that more effectively. So preparing PowerPoints, um, you know, presenting the, the results that you've obtained, writing coherent paragraphs about what you've done, you know, telling a story about what you've done, uh, et cetera. So um, also one of the other things that the capstone sequence addresses are things like uh, are, are what we call the soft engineering issues. And these are things that are um, realistic constraints, things like economic constraints, environmental constraints, sustainability issues, manufacturability, ethical issues, health and safety issues. So you can imagine that um, you have to address these things when making a product, right? You can't have, um, you know, if you're making a, a device that emanates radio frequency energy, for example, something that I tend to work on. You know, there are health and safety issues. There's regulatory issues, social and political, so regulatory issues. The FCC, the FHA, um, the, you know, all of these various government agencies have regulations to protect the public. And when you're performing engineering activities, you need to have some understanding of them or know where to go to get help in complying with these regulations. Additionally, of course, you know, economic, the economic feasibility of an engineering project is an extremely important aspect. Um, you know, if you've got to be able to, if you're working for a for-profit corporation, you have to be able to produce things and make money on them. Um, or, you know, a, a, or, or it has to have some other uh, economic value to the company. Um, you have to worry about manufacturability. Can I build this thing? Um, is it too big? Is it too small? Will it, you know, overheat something, etc.? So there are all of these other issues. Engineering is an optimization process that takes place in a very complicated world. It's much different than, say, pure science, 
where you isolate things down to very simple conditions to understand fundamental uh, physics. In, in engineering, you actually have to make things work in the real world. So understanding something about physics and math and engineering principles is important, but also understanding something about economics and manufacturability and the regulatory environment. All of these things play a role as well in engineering endeavors. And you know, part of the senior design core sequence is that we have some short lectures that cover these topics and you learn about them and, and, and think about them in the, in the context of your own projects. And that concludes my PowerPoint presentation. So um, I'm happy to um, uh, answer any questions or elaborate on any of the, the things that I talked about. Thanks, Dr. Averly. We do have a couple of questions in chat and um, uh, I'll start with those if you're, if you're okay with it. So there's a, a, a student asking um, how flexible is the societal need requirement for a project selection and would potential military application apply or should this solely be dedicated towards average consumers? No, um, military applications are fine. So when General Dynamics uh, sponsors projects, General Dynamics is a company that most of its profit comes from government contracts. Um, and I think the lion's share of those government contracts have to do with military applications uh, or at least defense applications. So yeah, you may, you may be working on a project that has um, some sort of defense implications. Now, typically in those cases, it would be limited to US citizens. And of course, you know, you're not dealing with any sort of classified information. It's usually more, um, uh, you know, basic research types of, of, of stuff. But yes, that's possible. The important thing is you have to have, you know, there's certain parts of your project that you can work on certain things that you do that you may want, may not want to disclose to the public. You may be bound by a non-disclosure agreement, for example, with a company and you don't disclose a specific application, but you do have to demonstrate the project to the public so there has to be some aspect of it that's that's publicly disclose, uh, disclosable. Thanks. Yeah, and I don't know if, uh, I can't think of senior design projects, but I know we have um, uh, more than one faculty who is involved in uh, military research and uh, things like that. So I think in our department, you'll find people who share that interest. Um, there's another question um, that, uh, uh, from Colton, can you be related to your project mentor or does that create a conflict? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I don't, I, I'm not sure if we've had that situation arise um, previously. I think as long as you disclose that, it, it's going to be okay. Um, you know, I don't know if, if it's your dad or something, we might want to discuss that in more detail about, um, you know, how that might influence the uh, the grade the mentor would give you <laughs> for better or worse. <laughs> yeah, depends on the relationship, I guess. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> How tough your dad is, I guess. Thank you. Um, and uh, uh, Anya is asking if she can provide her own funding. Yes. Sure. Thank you. And um, and you can provide a little stipend to me too. No, just that's a joke. <laughs> that's a joke. <laughs> but yeah. we've had, I, I mentored a team where one of the students, you know, I, I never asked um, what the student's particular um, financial situation was, but the student spent tens of thousands of dollars on the project of their own money. So yes, you can provide your own funding. Thanks. And then Fiona is asking, uh, what recommendations do you have for researching projects that will fulfill our power concentration requirements? Yeah, so the basic um, uh, requirement there is that you be mentored by a professor in the power concentration. Right? So on our website, uh, the faculty by research area are listed and you can look in the power area for faculty uh, and some ideas, maybe maybe connection to what they're doing. So <clears throat> if uh, one of the advisors doesn't mind putting that link in the chat now, that would be helpful. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, uh, David is asking, are there differences 
to the online senior design projects, um, how do teams link to create, to build or create the project? Yes, so um, the um, online students and the Tempe campus students are treated more or less equally. Um, the, uh, you know, depending on the situation with the pandemic, it may well, it may be that um, we have live classes where the Tempe students can attend in person, but the online students would attend by Zoom or by watching uh, a recording of the lecture. Um, this is what might happen for guest lectures. During the pandemic, everything's been on Zoom, so there really has been no difference between Tempe and online in terms of viewing course materials. One thing that the online students, if you're not in the area, you would not be would not be convenient for you to come to campus and work in a lab, for example, make measurements, say, in, in, in your faculty mentor's lab. So um, we do have teams that comprise both online and Tempe campus students. And the division of labor between those students needs to be thought out so that the online students are uh, able to contribute you know, equally, although perhaps by working on different aspects of the project. So it's something that's worked out kind of um, by the teams individually. And you can have teams that have, as I mentioned, both Tempe and on campus. I've dealt with that situation as a mentor many times and always, you know, things worked out just fine. Thank you. And uh, we have an interesting professional question here. Um, Anthony is asking, who gets to keep the project at the end? Okay, so it depends on who funded it. In the case of um, one of the students who asked before, uh, suggesting that they were going to plan to fund their own project, it's theirs, right? Um, the, uh, typically, if ASU funds it, ASU is going to want it. If a company funds it, they are going to keep it. Um, so it, it, it depends on the specific situation, um, you know, who basically who funded it, who paid for the components, for example. Yeah, I imagine early on that would be a discussion that the faculty mentor and the industry mentor may have about um, where these go. Um, uh, Daniel is asking, are teams typically formed around specific focus areas? Um, for example, mostly signals or mostly power, or do teams tend to do cross-disciplinary, cross-EE discipline projects? Um, we, we've had both sorts of projects. I think probably the majority are a little bit more focused. Yeah, but we do have, you know, both, both. Um, and there are projects that tend to cross EE disciplines. And even, even um, you know, last semester I had a project where one of the students had some mechanical engineering knowledge and there was some, um, you know, gear drives and motors and things like that involved. So it may even go outside of electrical engineering. Um, and then we have a, a, a general question about um, resources, books or skills you think would be valuable for students to get prior to starting senior design. First, first off, um, your academic advisor will make it clear the curriculum you need to complete before starting. So there's a baseline knowledge of curriculum that you need to have before you start. Uh, Dr. Abley, are there any skills or resources of addressing the professional side that you might throw out there? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it really depends on the nature of the project. Uh, and so it's really hard to pin down specific answers to that question. I think, um, you know, maybe, you know, certainly common to any type of project would be the ability to communicate effectively. So maybe picking up a book on technical communications or, you know, finding an opportunity to make a presentation something like that might be more helpful than any specific engineering skill. If you're going to work on, on, you know, maybe, you know, certain projects would require you maybe to be able to use an oscilloscope or to solder components. So perhaps uh, those sorts of skills could be helpful as well. Depending yeah. And then I always try to get a plug for is if you come across, if you have an idea, um, you should go to the faculty by research link that Annalisa posted in the chat and see if you can find a faculty who 
maybe as an expert in that area and maybe just have a casual, casual conversation about your idea um, to get to, it's not too early to have those kinds of conversations and the earlier, the better. And maybe it'll go somewhere, maybe it won't, but that'd be a good start. Um, and then finally, Dr. Ibley, we just have a couple of more questions about team formation process. You touched on that, but do you have any, in a nutshell, how can you explain how teams are formed? Yeah, so it's it's a very ad hoc process um, and teams get, get formed in, in any number of ways. Let me give you um, maybe a, a, just briefly a couple of scenarios. In one scenario, a professor uh, produces a well-defined project, you know, with very specific goals, and I post that document, and and then um, students will go on Piazza or whatever the replacement for Piazza ends up being, and discuss it among themselves, and reach out to the mentor, and connect with each other, reach out to the mentor, and then form a team. And if there's a lot of interest, the professor maybe uh, allow multiple teams. So for the projects that I'm mentoring, I really just wanted two teams, um, one to work on a receiver side, one to work on a transmitter side for a company. And I ended up uh, accepting a third team that's also gonna work on the receiver side because I decided that that was you know, the more complicated aspect of it. So um, the students connected with each other, they reached out to me um, and I selected them, so to speak. In other cases, um, students will get together even before senior design and say that, you know, realize they want to work together. So a team of say four students already know they want to work together. They kind of know what they want to work on. They approach a professor and the professor agrees to mentor them. So it's like I said, it's, it's kind of very open-ended, very ad hoc, um, but, you know, being proactive, reaching out to other students, um, et cetera, is going to be very important. Thanks very much. And then um, Tim, I can answer this one. He was asking about the sequence, if whether it starts in fall, summer, or spring. And um, they, the senior design sequence uh, starts in either fall or spring, but never in the summer. Um, uh, and so we do not offer 488 or 489 in any summers. Um, now, let me add something to that, Father, if I can. Um, if you start, Triple E 488 in the spring, you are allowed to work on the project over the summer, but you don't have to. Many teams choose to work on it over the summer, um, but you're not getting academic credit for that. Yeah, and, and it, that could be a strategy, but it also often just falls down to where you are in the curriculum. So that's a great question for your advisor if you want to plan ahead on when you would do it and. Uh, to try to graduate in the right time. Um, and I think that most of our questions, a couple of caveats I wanted to, to point out from uh, from the academic advising administrative standpoint. Um, I know Dr. Abley touched on it, but it's, it's critical in those early weeks that you communicate with your teams. <laughs> uh, don't fall off the radar. Uh, it, it is a, more of a professional experience than a lot of students are used to. Um, and sometimes students don't realize that and they wait to be prompted to participate. And I, I know Dr. Abley probably shares my interest in making sure that doesn't happen. Yeah, uh, it's not a good scenario when someone comes to you six weeks in the semester and says, I never found a team. Can you put me on a team? Because um, that puts me in a bad spot because I have to insert that student into a team. And, um, you know, as you can imagine, the team of four students who I'm saying, well, I found a fifth person for you. They may not be too happy about it. And the mentor may not be too happy about it either. So, you know, being very, very proactive. And if you're having difficulty connecting, um, reaching out to the course coordinator, which might be myself or, or Professor Kazicki, um, that would be, you know, one thing that you could do. Yeah, yeah, participate early. And then um, if you guys choose to interact over email, um, check your email. If you choose to interact over meetings, attend the meetings or communicate. Communicating is uh, the main, I know, uh, the main issue that we've uh, uh, we've had. Uh, not, not a major one, but it can cause students problems and that sort of thing. Um, uh, yeah, J Jacob is asking if we have a, a link for past projects. We do have... Um, the old senior design 
presentations posted. Oh, Cheryl, don't we have, um, I guess we didn't record those, did, did we? Oh, well, I thought they were recorded. I think they are recorded. Yeah, I think, I think we can give these students a link to that. I could try to find that. Yeah, Jacob, let's let's see if I can figure that. And um, uh, and, and James, you'd sent me something. I worry that the chat's going to go away at the end. So I'm going to put my email in the chat. James, if you don't mind emailing your question directly to me, just so I don't miss it. Um, and then um, Fiona is asking, uh, the biggest pitfalls people run into and what are the habits you've seen in most successful projects? I think. Uh, the pitfalls from the administrative standpoint are the ones we just kind of talked about is uh, poor communication. Uh, uh, so please, uh, please communicate with your team well. Um, professional yeah. habits that Dr. Averly mentioned. Do you have anything to add to that, Dr. Yeah, Averly? I, I could talk all day about the pitfalls, <laughs> but uh, you know, just from I've done, you know, I, I've coordinated the capsule sequence for 20 years, so I've seen a lot of students are always finding new pitfalls to run into. So. Um, but the biggest one is lack of communication, just checking out, not responding to your teammates, not responding to your mentor, um, you know, just not, you know, being proactive about what needs to be done. Um, yeah, the biggest pitfall, I think, as, as Bob said, it's the, it's the lack of communication. And it's, you know, there are issues sometimes with um, personalities right? Letting personalities get in the way of getting the project completed. Look, you don't have to like somebody to work with them. That's just, you know, this is life. Okay. Um, you, 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 you do not have to get along. Uh, you know, you don't want to necessarily have to agree with a person on, um, on anything, but except, you know, getting the project done for the, you know, for the sake of the project. So that that's an issue. Um, letting you know, letting personal dislikes get in the way. Um, but the main thing is lack of communication. Just losing interest in the project or letting other things distract you from it. And so the habits that um, result in the most successful projects. I think the biggest thing is is that there's an enthusiasm for the project. Um, the most successful projects are ones where all of the teammates are contributing uh the mentor is providing you know the, the, the team is is getting appropriate help from the mentors um the project wasn't overly ambitious or too unambitious um you know it's it's kind of uh the situation is that you know there's a um you know keeping at it getting through the getting through the hard times um you know, being enthusiastic about the project, communicating with each other when there's issues, that uh, that always helps. Well, thanks very much. I think we hit most of the questions. Um, so thanks for the insights, and uh, um, we're excited to for you guys to join when you get when you get ready. So again, talk to your advisors about planning curricular wise. Yeah, go for it. So the one the one thing too, from an advising standpoint, just make sure that you are communicative because you have to finish the series consecutively. So if you fail, you have to start it all over again and it's not automatic that you're eligible to do that. So you'd have to go through an appeal process. So it's really important to stay connected with your, your team and you know push through. Yeah, don't do that. That's, that's don't a rough, do that. yeah, don't do that. <laughs> Okay. Uh, There's one more question. Is it normal to not have chosen partners until the class begins? And I would say um, the answer to that is the majority of students have not yet formed a team when, until the class begins. The majority have not. Some have, some have not. And most have not. And But the, the situation is if you arrive into the class and you're not in a team, you need to be, um, you know, very willing to work hard to find a team, right? You need to be reaching out to a number of people. You need to be reaching out to mentors. Um, yes. So it is, it is um, you know, I, I think the word normal is kind of um, falling out of favor here. But it is, um, it is the majority of students have not, are not in a team. They may know like one other person they want to work with. They may not know anyone, um, but they're not yet in a team. 
I would say yes, it, it, it is the most common situation. Well, thanks very much, um, students, for your questions. And Dr. Aberly, thanks for taking the time today. We appreciate it. Uh, do you have any parting words for these folks? Any sage advice? Um, yeah, I think if, you, if you're careful about with whom you end up working, um, both as far as the team and the mentor and picking a project that you're interested in and taking ownership of that project uh, and helping to define the goals and objectives and the scope, I think you'll, you'll find it a very rewarding experience. Yeah, we love seeing the projects. Most of the, a lot of the advisors attend and we watch and, um, and, and um, uh, faculty do. And it's always impressive to see what you guys come up with. So we, we love this part and we hope you do too. Thank you. Thanks all. Thanks for being here. Bye-bye now.